say some key components um, within the psychological assessment when we're looking at sexual offenders. Distortions, cognitive distortions, assessing thinking errors that are part of the core process for sexual offenders being able to commit their crimes. Um, Self-serving thoughts, thought patterns that reduce normal barriers to committing acts. Um, this keyword distorts reality. It does. It changes it for them. When we think of distortions, guys, cognitive uh, behavioral psychology really delves into identifying distortions. And the theory is that everybody has distortions in their thinking. Um, an example is you might be in denial about the last test grade you got in, in one of your courses. And you're, you're like, don't want to think about it. And then as the weeks go on, or maybe as the days go on, you kind of come to terms with, wow, I really... I really screwed up on that last exam. I better, I better start studying for the next one. Um, temporary denial, not such a bad thing. It kind of helps us stay out of bad mood states. But the idea is that different distortions, that's just one, all or nothing thinking when people think in black and white terms, that's a distortion because we know life is, is much more in the gray and ambiguous than just black and white terms. But they, it's self-serving thoughts. They, they distort ways that allow them to avoid the responsibility for their crimes. Um, ways to rationalize or ways to intellectualize or ways to, like I said, distort, change. You're changing the reality of it by distorting it in your mind. So several scales develop to assess for presence of cognitive distortions. Yeah, we, we, can, we can assess for them, um, but research is either unsupported or underdeveloped. When applying it towards, uh, I think, forensic psychology, it gets a little more difficult because we don't have the validity um, or reliability sometimes in the testing for distortions. And it's often based on, on self-report from what they're telling us about their thoughts. It's very difficult to examine thinking outside of using self-report, what people tell us. So we do a lot of interview, a lot of interview, and a lot of interview. And then we try to come up with distortions or we try to pinpoint distortions or suggest distortions, but to validate them is it's tough. Uh, victim empathy research suggests sexual offenders don't have difficulty feeling for other people, but do have specific inability to feel for their victim. Yeah, it's, it says there are well not well-validated scales rather designed for this purpose. Uh, back to the interviewing process and trying to see if there's a degree of feeling bad about something or feeling bad about their victim. Um, so what we're looking at are... are are, are offenders that will have empathy for their mother or have empathy for their child, their own child, that is, but not for the victim, or have empathy towards women in general, but not towards their specific victim. It's almost like they're blanking out that empathy or they're, they're not able to, to feel it. That, again, remember, antisocial personality disordered folks can fake empathy well, and that's our problem too, is when we're testing for it or assessing for it, they could do a good job at faking empathy. Now, a polygraph might be able to pick up on that, but some of them could be polygraphs. They're that good because they often believe what they're saying. Um, clinical interviews and collateral records, collateral records searches, um, best options for assessing. We rely on that. And remember, the, again, how accurate that is always comes into question. Sexual fantasies, the Wilson sex fantasy inventory, it's used to examine differences between child molesters and non-sexual offenders. Clinical interviews used most frequently to assess sexual fantasies among offenders. Again, we're, we're doing the interview process. We're, we're delving into their sexual fantasies, what arouse them, what give them a sense of excitement, but also power and control. Power and control, those two words really haven't come up enough um, as we've been looking at this material. But remember, when it comes to sexual assaulting, uh, there's always an element of control and power. Um, I remember a story once um, by, put myself in here, a story once by a woman that uh, there was a, a serial rapist that was making their way through was Seattle and, and outside of Seattle, outer, you know, Washington state, and um, had raped um, and, uh, and then gunned down, um, executed basically, two or three women. And he was doing it at convenience stores or, or places uh, uh, when you could isolate a woman in the back. And there was one woman that um, gave a good eyewitness description of him, which ultimately led to his arrest. And he wasn't able to sexually assault her, and he basically fled. And they said, what happened? She said, I fought him. I laughed at him. I tried to humiliate him. I did everything in my power to not let him know that I was scared. I did not show fear. 
And as a result, he couldn't become sexually aroused. He had no, no feeling of control or power and fled in humiliation. And police, you know, she reported to the police. They came, they got her interview. Um, she gave a great description. It led to his arrest. Probably saved the life of, of other potential victims. Um, but she didn't show fear. It was kind of interesting. Um, power and control. He wasn't able to uh, derive any of that feeling from uh, that encounter with her. So um, let's move on. Discussing some risk factors. Uh, a meta-analysis on sexual offending. Um, in other words, multiple studies combined um, have identified uh, some, some interesting things here. The strongest predictor of sexual recidivism, we're repeating it again, is phallometric responses towards children or deviant preferences. So as much as we couldn't make um, you know, guilt statements or innocent statements based on that, it was the strongest indicator in, in terms of were they going to commit, recommit crimes, showing them pictures and seeing if there was sexual arousal. Um, empathy for victims, denial of sexual offense, low motivation for treatment, uh, sexual abuse as a child, uh, were unrelated to sexual recidivism, unrelated. So when we looked at the empathy, um, lack of empathy sometimes, denial of it, I didn't do it, low motivation for treatment, not really working their program, and sexual abuse, were they sexually abused as a child, um, we couldn't find a correlation here. Unrelated, according to this, uh, this meta-analysis that was done. Also, sexual offenders are less likely to recidivate for sexual offenses than non-sexual offenses. They're less likely to repeat for sexual offenses. That doesn't go for non-sexual offenses, though. Um, sexual recidivism rates vary with time. It says 10 to 15 percent after five years, 20 percent after 10 years, and about 30 to 40 after 20 years. Um, these are likely underestimates. So it's almost like, okay, uh, only 10 to 15 percent after five years were able to uh, go without repeating it. But it goes up after 10 years, a higher likelihood that they will. After 20 years, 30, 40 percent chance that they will recidivate, that they will actually commit again. So as time goes on, it's almost like, okay, they're keeping the urges together. They're not acting on it after five years. And you'd think after time goes on, the sexual arousal or the paraphilia um, might subside, but we're not finding that. We're really not. So when it comes to treatment or management of sexual offenders, some of the research, uh, Hansen in 2002 found that 12.3% of sexual recidivism rates for treated sex offenders um, and 16.8% for untreated sex offenders. So 12.3% um, with treatment, uh, recidivism was, was that low. Without treatment, it was not much higher, though, only at 16.8, according to Hansen. In 2011, Olver um, found that with treatment, the reduction was close to 27.6%, overall attrition, rather. Um, and then some of the predictors of dropout in treatment programs, uh, people that are younger tend to drop out more, more prior offenses, uh, presence of antisocial personality disorder, lower intelligence, higher scores on risk assessment measures, and motivation. Um, highest risk offenders were also the ones who were most likely to drop out of treatment. Um, overall, it's hard to keep them in treatment. And a lot of times treatment is, is predicated on getting a letter or signature or basically for probation officers to for, basically to stay out of jail again so they don't go back to jail. They're court ordered. In other words, it's part of their treatment. It's part of their, you know, in, in order to stay, um, you know, um, to stay out of jail, they have to go to treatment. And so when they're going to group treatment, individual treatment, sometimes the motivation is simply um, a legal one and not because they necessarily see anything wrong with themselves or want to get better. Um, treatment and management of sex offenders, many problems with sex offender treatment literature. Uh, yeah, poor comparison groups, small number of studies, poor research design. So we really uh, don't have uh, good information on the uh, treatment literature and how well it actually works. This is a, a real debatable area of uh, treatment. Components, um, cognitive behavioral programs, denial and minimization, crime-specific distortions, and victim empathy. They work on that, trying to help them see the reality of the situation, break through the cognitive or thinking distortions and errors, and help them see it the way it is. 
they t- target underlying deficits. Uh, they look at their self-esteem. Is it low? Is it high? Um, social skills, anger. Sometimes we look at low self-esteem, social skills being poor as a reason for them to sexually offend rather than cultivate normal re- relationships. Um, with opposite sex or same sex partners, um, there might be a, a, a difficultness in doing that, and as a result, uh, more highly or more likely to um, find deviant ways of, of meeting their sexual needs. Anger, drinking, assertiveness, social perception, performance evaluation, intimacy deficits, and that's kind of what I was talking about with this you know, tell, take low self esteem, poor social skills, and it might lead to intimacy deficits, which cause them to seek deviant routes to get their gratification. Relapse prevention, also the pharmaceutical part, what kind of medications work and help um, with their problems. When it comes to juvenile sex offenders, it says almost 20% of those arrested for sexual assault are below the age of 18. Yeah, we, we I, again, um, seen this quite a bit in the past in the clinical work that I've done um, with kids and teens, um, so more specifically younger teens, um, getting in trouble for sexual assaults. Not always rape, not always, you know, um, sexual molestation, but sometimes even, you know, I've seen kids that got in trouble for forms of Freudism in their schools, for touching girls inappropriately in the hallways, um, or trying to meet sexual gratification through other means of that nature. Uh, general recidivism is much higher, uh, tend to engage in a variety of non-sexual antisocial behavior, um, commit a wide range of sexual offenses. And since many adult sex offenders start in adolescence, like we said, um, it, it gets wired in early on. Um, it doesn't happen in adulthood, typically. It's been going on since the start of puberty, more than likely. Um, little is known about female juvenile sex offenders. Our, our big population is males. And we have more male offenders, adult and um, also adolescent or, or mom. Females compose less than 2% of all sex offenders, and less than 2% of all female offenders, very, very small uh, offender group, uh, between 6 to 60% of female victims and 14 to 26% of male victims report a female perpetrator. Um, under-reporting makes study difficult. Most studies have small sample sizes. Um, higher rates of sexual abuse, trauma, and, psych- and uh, psych- psychopathy or psychopathology involved. Um, little research on exclusive treatment of female sex offenders. Um, like I said, I, I think that um, I think overall you're going to see less offending on the female part. There are females that do offend, um, and maybe it is underreported. But I, I, I think even taking that into consideration, they might make up a small minority of sexual offending, and it probably has something to do um, with uh, the general makeup of, of, of their um, sexual um, identity um, and the things that either go wrong or right in the development of sexual identity early on. Uh, females seem to be less impacted in a, in a um, deviant way, per se. Um, in concluding, uh, towards the end of the chapter, it talks about sexual offender legislation. and Every state um, has uh, has what we say, registration, notification laws, um, residency laws, and uh, also the last bullet point, their sexual uh, violent predator laws. And some of them vary slightly or, or dramatically in some areas, but um, check in with local law enforcement. Um, prohibit offenders from living in certain distances of areas deemed high risk, uh, for example, a school or neighborhoods with lots of children. Um, Sexual violent predator, or SVP laws, intended to continue a sex offender's confinement if mentally ill and dangerous. I usually aim to the most dangerous. Yeah, I mean, um, laws and keeping them out of the general public if they are a danger to other people and can be considered a high-risk uh, danger. And I know it's hard to know sometimes. That's part of the controversy. It's, you know, we have uh, people that... Um, are on the sex offenders list and we can look when there's apps we can check on websites and find out within our area um, people that have had to register but you don't always get all the information um, in terms of how much of a risk they are are they low moderate to high we don't always know and we can't always make the, the prediction even though their their offense might have been considered more of a a low risk offense or their considered low risk of recidivism, um, like we said, our